I am so excited to introduce you to Dr. Susan Laverick. Susan's first class communication background has planned Citigroup and BBC in London. Today, her Geneva Consultancy provides expert tailored communication training to the peace building and corporate sectors. This includes public speaking, pitching, and building effective teams. She has trained international peace laureates, making their maiden speeches at the United Nations in Geneva and New York, and creates communication strategies for emerging NGOs. She has a particular concern for women moving into leadership roles across sectors and works with them to enhance their gravitas and professional impact. She's a guest lecturer at the Graduate Graduate Institute of Geneva and the University of Geneva, where she teaches future leaders how to present with gravitas. She has a doctorate in English completed on a full-time Australian government scholarship for researchers of exceptional promise and is an ICF qualified executive coach. Her articles on professional development have been published in a US peer reviewed journal. She's been a resident of Geneva since 1997 and Susan has Australian and French nationality, which is a very odd combination, I got to say. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us today. Well, it's really funny, Sally, and thank you for inviting me. When one hears, um, as we say in French, a, bio, um, a biography, you think, who's that person? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, no, it's, it's wonderful to be with you. And I know it's very early in the States, so thank you. Oh, my pleasure. And I'm sure it's very, well, it looks like the sun's shining nicely there. What time is it there around? It's um, five o'clock. It's what we oh. call in our family golden hour, which means it's apero time. But not yet. Don't worry. <laughs> That's awesome. This is water, everyone. <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> so I thought we could talk today a little bit about your journey. So tell us about the career that you had and what, how do you actually ended up in Geneva? Um, yes, well, it's good that my husband is out at the moment because I can be more open. Um, he is the most amazing man, but um, sometimes the stories we, we share are not ones our husbands or partners relate to, and they think, no, that's not my memory. Um, <laughs> I'm being frivolous, of course. Look, I had the most wonderful career in London. I worked with the BBC. I'm just throwing my note taker down. Um, and it was just for me the perfect career and it came after maternity leave <clears throat> excuse me i'm going to put myself on mute again and we all know what is involved in that where we're reevaluating where do i belong where should i go anyway long story short this was the job that was always meant to be for me and it played to my passion for art and history and literature and this might sound terribly superficial, but emeralds and diamonds and 19th century costumes. I don't have emeralds and di diamonds, by the way. Um, <laughs> but it's that whole notion of the things I loved when I was growing up and that fed into my passions as a in my first career. And anyway, it was perfectly calibrated for me. It was finding locations for dramas and documentaries, and it was just remarkable, and I loved it. Oh, nice. So finding locations for BBC mm. shows. That's it. And That's um, fun. <laughs> stately homes, but um, it all came to a very dramatic end because um, I do want me to tell you the story. It's, it's nothing terrible. Absolutely. Um, sure. We were, um, I was offered a very big promotion and I was so excited. I thought this is just I can't believe it. Mm -hmm. And of course, what the universe gives with one hand, she often takes away with the other. Mm -hmm. And so I said there and then, <clears throat> excuse me, I said there and then on the spot, yes, yes, please, I'd love it. And I remember running home. Well, I didn't run. I took the underground and I got off to get some champagne or mm -hmm. Prosecco at the time and was in such a dream that I think that the shop person said, did she pay for that? And of course I had to run back and say, sorry, no, I wasn't stealing it here. Here's my money. Um, <laughs> and I got home and my husband exceptionally was at home. And I thought, this is very odd because he's never home before eight o'clock at night. This was mm -hmm. like a hundred years ago. And I said, have you lost your job? 
because that's all I could think. And he said, mm. no, I've been offered a new job. So I had this bottle of champagne to celebrate my new job. And he was full of, and rightly so, his new job. And to cut a very long and um, tedious story shut or closed or short, you mm -hmm. wouldn't think I was a language specialist. <laughs> um, we just decided that actually we had to make a decision. And so my career was packed away and mm -hmm. I left the BBC and that was a source of great grief to me, mm -hmm. as I'm sure you would relate to, you know, when we're in yes. our 30s and we think we found what is our proper role and it plays to our strengths and then something happens. And it probably sounds very ungrateful <clears throat> because, of course, we went to Geneva, beautiful place, French mm -hmm. culture, but it was just trying to readjust and, and I really learnt a lot from that and and I suppose and then I'll be quiet because I'm sure you need to speak <laughs> too but what I did learn I think many years later in fact even now that that was not the right job for me much as mm -hmm. I love it so right. what I'm doing now is and it's as though we have to experience these um I suppose accidents along the way mm -hmm. Which, yeah. over which we have no control. I mean, would you agree with that? Absolutely. And you know, I had a very similar situation happening for myself. Um, and it was about five years ago where we flipped for my husband's career because he has he had position over in our French province of Canada in Quebec. Um, and it was supposed to be a 10-year contract. So I had a, a high corporate career, which I loved. Um, I worked remotely for about six months for a team back in the other side of the country, which was completely not heard of at that point in time. It was pre-COVID. Um, and I ended up giving up that job at the end of that year because I just didn't feel like I was being valued anymore. But it was a big piece of me that was leaving sort of a legacy I had created and a really successful career for myself. And now I had to reinvent myself and say, well, what's next? And what ended up being next is what I'm doing today. <laughs> which is so fulfilling, but yet there was a time in there where it felt very uncomfortable, mm -hmm. where it was like, oh, now what? Like, what do I get to do now? Now I had a choice to make. And so that was, I think, one of the things that I really um, appreciated afterwards, after that change that was unexpected, mm -hmm. because I, I had no idea that I was choosing, going to choose to leave my career. Which but I, that's so fascinating because I think it's almost as though the change which is imposed upon us by circumstances mm -hmm. is almost an apprenticeship in exactly. preparing for the next step, don't you think? Absolutely, absolutely it is. And I, I always believe that the universe has got my back, but I also believe that there's also new opportunities for me to explore myself within that, yeah. to be able to see where I'm going to be going next. And so I think, you know, your story definitely resonates with me. And so... As you've, you've gone through this, how did it actually feel? What was the result of that? And where did you sort of make that turning point? It, I, I'll be absolutely honest with you. And one, one should never squander the years, but it probably took me, that was nine, nine. it probably took me 10 years to mm. find my feet. Um, yes, I, you know, married to a French man and, the French culture is very embedded in us. Um, mm -hmm. So it was not unfamiliar moving into a French speaking state, but it was almost as though, and I'm sure you will relate to this because I know what you're doing now is absolutely your passion and your purpose. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're, you're just spreading that message with such um, authenticity to those mm -hmm. women you're helping. But it was almost as though, I was plodding and I was plodding and I hated it because I'm mm -hmm. not a plodder. I'm fairly, I don't say this with any ego, but I'm a fairly dynamic person and mm -hmm. I like things to move and I like to be in control. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and and so for quite a few years, I, I trained as a, an English teacher and I didn't like it because I hated these people who didn't want to learn about literature because it was corporate <laughs> teaching. And, and then I can't remember, I did a couple of other things. And then I decided, well, I'm going to go and do something at university, get back to mm. university. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I applied to do my, my doctorate. And I already had a, um, an English degree. And, and that to me, to answer your question, 
was the first shift in the planets. Mm, nice. And and I remember my father, my father, my husband, my husband <laughs> saying, um, "Oh, you're you're where you should be." Mm -hmm. And and at the time, I thought you're right because this will lead, you know, English literature, my passion for writing and words and language and all of the things that we love in mm -hmm. literature. And teaching and writing papers and presenting them. That's where, when I did a huge amount of presenting um, oh, nice. in America and in Australia. And yet ultimately when I finished, and that, gosh, we're talking about a really slow learner here. <laughs> Your listeners will know. <laughs> My God, she took ages to get it together. Um, but really just almost being blindfolded and thinking, this is it. Mm. And and it was for four and a half years. And I was very lucky, Sally. I never take it for granted. I had this scholarship and I was able to travel backwards and forwards. And by then my girls were a little bit older, so it didn't matter. <laughs> they, they don't need you after a certain point. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I love and adore them both. But it, it became very apparent to me as I finished this research. And it's a huge thing to achieve mm -hmm. just in terms of what you're doing. And I remember thinking, no, I don't want to be an academic. And in fact, I was too old. And oh. you and I know, well, I was, I was too old to start because mostly people are in their early mm -hmm. 30s, or their late 20s. And, you know, they've got publication lists as long as, um, right. <laughs> you know, a, a, a marathon run. And, yeah. and I just thought, no, this, and I've really felt discombobulated because mm. this what is going on in my life that it's almost like jack of all no jill of all trades mm -hmm. and mistress of none but um, i actually posted about this on linkedin yesterday and i was really amazed by the feedback i got from people saying oh my god this pivot business mm -hmm. which i have experienced it's 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 an incredibly complex thing and um <laughs> and so there i was at the ripe old age of what i was thinking no I don't think I can do this. And and I did mm -hmm. want to go back to Geneva. So that, that's when the next iteration occurred. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm hearing is as you're making that pivot, we we tend to go to where our passions are because obviously English that was one of your passions. And so you explored it. And going through that, you had a lot of, you know, you obviously gained a lot of information. You you educated yourself. But at the end of the day, it wasn't really what you were made to do. There was something bigger still calling you. But well, at, the, at the time, it didn't feel like that. Well, I love the way you framed that. and But I think you're right. And I, I began to sense that at the time, just as you did when you did the mm. pivot from the very highly you know, C-suite mm -hmm. corporate job into what you're doing at the moment. And I just remember thinking, actually, this is, well, I'm much older than you are this is probably my last chance to get it right. And again, mm. it was only by a fortuitous opportunity that I think I finally have. Touche le bois, as you know, we say in French. <laughs> um, I think, I know, I know I have it right, but it was just an opportunity was presented to me. And I thought, mm. and you know what we're like with imposter syndrome. And at the time, yes. um, I was asked to do some training for, um, an international organization whose peace laureates were going mm. to be presenting in Geneva. And I was working for a consultancy at the time. And this very clever lady for whom I worked, she, I said, oh, you do it. I thought, I know I possibly <laughs> I thought, No, no, no. I said, you do it. It's great for the consultancy. You do it. And she yeah. said, no, I'm going on a trip. You'll have to do it. It was the best thing that could have happened mm. to me. Because it was a, all it was was a referral. I mean, I was interviewed, but the person who said, oh, look, you should speak to Susan. I really respect her, blah, blah. Um, and really, from that moment, I, I decided, look, I love teaching. I love language. I have an ability. I mean, we all know what our specific mm -hmm. skills are. I can look at a text and see where it needs to be fixed. Mm -hmm. And I know how to make something impactful and I know how to teach. And so that's when I started putting some of the disparate pieces together and they've been there all the time mm -hmm. but it was just a moment in time I suppose that I realized actually this is an opportunity I'll take it and really that was mm -hmm. the first step to where I'm now 
That's, that's so incredible. And I, I love the, the path that you were on because that path shows us that people show up unexpectedly, opportunities show up unexpectedly. But what you did was you actually stepped into it regardless of what you thought mm -hmm. that you would be qualified for it or whether it would be something that you should be doing. But you stepped into it with that trust and that faith that your friend was aligned with you and knew that you could do this. And I think a lot of us miss those intuitive moments where we say, we start judging ourselves. And it is that imposter syndrome that kicks in. Am I good enough? And so I love that you actually listen to your <laughs> your inner voice and said, no, I'll just do this and not have a big expectation on the outcome from what I can tell, but just, oh, I'll do it because these are all the things that I like to do. But now it's led you to a whole different picture. And well, so I will, as a caveat, just say I wouldn't mm -hmm. have done it if I didn't feel I was competent because right. it, you know, training people to go, and deliver at the Palais de Nation in Geneva. That's what was freaking me out. But <laughs> no, I felt reasonably comfortable, but it was just that sense of, oh my God. Mm -hmm. And it's crossing that line, isn't it, Sally? Yes. When you yes. know you can do it. Um, but yes, so I just thought I'd qualify that just in case any of my clients get to listen to this. And they <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. I know that you would have been... Um brilliant in doing that but I think it's taking that opportunity and trusting that that's what you're supposed to do and just do it um, and the other so, thing is and I, I'm sure you agree with this mm -hmm. that our networks are our net worth yes. aren't they and if you don't I'm mean, okay it was my consultant director consultancy director who said do it but the opportunity came from someone who knew of me and I just think without our networks what we give in and what they give to us and what all mm -hmm. the rest of it we would not, I think our momentum professionally would stall. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And and I think, you know, I've what I've witnessed a lot of people and I, I coach a lot of people where they definitely question things that show up that can lead them to that next brilliant mm. opportunity because they question themselves and they start to really judge themselves. And although they want to do it, they they hold themselves back. And that's part of how I am able to coach them to get through that as well as because I can see in them what they can't see. Yeah. And sometimes having, you know, support like yourself or a good friend or a colleague or your network that understands and sees things in you can be so powerful for us. And having somebody by your side that you can trust to have those types of conversations with that can see in you what you don't see in yourself is really powerful. Oh, absolutely. And I'm so pleased you said that because I've got some notes written down here, things I wanted to <laughs> ask you, um, because we hear so much endlessly about the glass ceiling. But mm. I always think of the glass wall that separate, mm. and the tr transparent gl glass is transparent, yeah. um, the glass wall that is between us and the next step. Mm. And it's almost as though we can see it. And we know, look, I can see the landscape. I know how to navigate it. But no. There's something holding me back and it's it's in us isn't it mm -hmm, so thank it goodness for people like you who are activating that confidence and because otherwise we would never never move into the next stage exactly. yeah and um, i think and my father awesome. always used to say to me um and it accords with what you said a bit earlier that he used to say if you're going somewhere turn up or, no, mm -hmm. if you're going somewhere, be there. And I never understood what he meant as a child, mm -hmm. other than yeah. be on time, because he was an ex-British Army officer. <laughs> We're always on time. So on I, time. Married a, I married a Frenchman who doesn't know what time is. Um, bless <laughs> um, but it was that notion of if you're going somewhere, be there, be present. And that's what mm -hmm. you said earlier, something mm -hmm. about, part, you know, your, who you are and being there and and showing mm. that um so important and especially for younger women i feel yeah yeah well i find also though there's a lot of women that are are my age range i won't say your age range, <laughs> my age range that have fallen back into a lot of um disbelief about themselves because of their age and because of you know where they currently are in life 
And it mm. really opens up the door when we start talking about everything that they bring to the table, because I think there's still a lot of ageism in the corporate world um, and diminishing what we have to offer. But I just feel the more we age, the more we have to offer. <laughs> and there's so much more brilliance inside of us. And if we're not feeling comfortable where we currently are, there's other opportunities for us to either Absolutely. create or to join in on. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I just really love that piece of what I get to do as well, because I do believe that we can continue to grow throughout our whole life. And that to me is an, a critical element. And I love that. And we both know and adore Jen. Mm -hmm. um, and she did the human design for yeah. me. And I, I'm sure she's done it with you as well. But it really touched a chord with me because when you look at the phases of someone's life mm -hmm. and some oh it's mumbo jumbo just nonsense but we have these decades in our lives and mm. when you're in your 20s oh it's amazing and 30s and 40s and then uh, 49 I could never say I was 50 mm. I always used to say I'm 40 10 and my girls used to <laughs> dissolve in hysteria they, mommy you're 50 I'm a shh <laughs> I mean, honestly, it's it's true uh, because I think each decade opens up something new. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's so important what you're doing because there is we don't achieve our full mm -hmm. potential often in life. Yes. And so to have someone to be a catalyst, which I suppose is mm -hmm. what you are, and thank goodness you are. And to have people like me who are encouraging them to find levels of communication, gravitas and presence, and you mix them together. And it's a very powerful cocktail, mm -hmm. which I would, I'd i had when I had turned <clears throat> 40, 10. Um, <laughs> well, and I think as we, you know, as we do move forward in our career and our life, we are going to have shifts and turns because I think we get to know ourselves much better and we get to really understand that I get to choose what I get to do and I get mm -hmm. to choose who I get to work with and I get to choose everything about my life as opposed to, I think so many of us fall into the trap of just doing what we're expected to do, mm -hmm. right? Whether it was being a stay at home mom, whether it was, you know, being a working mom, I'm just using women as an example here, whether it was, you know, having to have your corporate career in addition to that and looking after the home and the family and all, you know, the fa the whole family dynamic, et cetera. And we do so much for everybody else. That sometimes we, we get pushed to the back and we, we forget about who we truly are and what we truly want because we're so trapped in just the everyday do, 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 mm -hmm. do, do to serve everybody else. And I think we also lose a lot of our inner joy and that freedom that we we could have in our life if we tapped into something that we really have a passion for and that we excel in, because when mm. we tap into that passion, we typically excel. Absolutely. And, and absolutely. And just tapping into one of your lovely phrases that I commented on in one of your <laughs> LinkedIn posts, the joie de vivre. And mm. it's, it's tragic. I find that yes. so many people, men and women, not just yes. women, they don't have that mm -hmm. because for all those reasons, life is difficult, we know, and careers and families and whatever, and everything's coming into, it's almost like a barrage of cannon fire. And you think, oh my God, just stop for a minute because mm -hmm. life is short yes. and every moment is precious. Mm -hmm. And if we can't find, okay, I'm not suggesting we all go around saying, yes, it's a wonderful day. Where's the champagne? I love my passion. <laughs> but if we can't, engage with something we love and that's mm -hmm. what you're doing and that's what I'm doing yes. then what's the point mm -hmm. yeah I, I completely agree and mm -hmm. I've seen so many people that have come to me um, and they don't even have they don't even know what they would have for a future goal or passion or anything and it and because that's basically how I start out with my clients and it's like wow so that was a real eye-opener to me that there yeah. was no direction for their future because they were so focused on today. And I think the beauty of what you get to do and what I get to do is we get to open that up. Now, yeah. who are your ideal clients? Um, I don't think I have ideal clients, but mm -hmm. the clients I serve tend to be um, 
the, well, the, the humanitarian and peace build, building mm. sectors, because that's just, again, one of the little directions that I was um, led into, introductions and work. Mm -hmm. So if you said to me which are the areas I love most, it is making contributions to the communication strategies or communi effective communication mm, for people yes. who are working in those, those, those zones. Although recently I've started um, working in the corporate sector and I'm very glad to have that opportunity, but I realize when I go in to do a you know, five-day program and I come home and I think, oh, it's, um, I'm glad I have mm -hmm. the, the, the areas, the sectors that, you know, the education, mm -hmm. the humanitarian, which I feel I can make a difference mm -hmm. rather than bringing you in, look, we just need to tick this box that we've done this. Yeah. And it, it, yeah. Yeah. And you went like this each time for your heart when you brought that up. And so that to me means that's where your heart truly lies. But I mean, I'm a businesswoman too. And of course, yes. I will do a program, but I'm very discriminating about who I will work with. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. that's, again, it's it's something that's come with age. I mean, yes. 15 years ago, I would have thought, oh, got to work with everyone, can't say no, you got to keep going. And <laughs> I think, no, I don't care. I mean, I'd never say that. And I hope no one listens to this, but I mean, I really, <laughs> if you want to work with me, you have to share my values. Yes. And that's, they're very simple, honest mm -hmm. values. Mm -hmm. And if not, au revoir. <laughs> yeah, well, it just won't be the right fit for them either. Right? And you feel share those values. women who come to work with you, I'm mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We have to discriminate, be very uh, discerning yeah. on who we work with in order to be able to get Luxury them. Age, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So now tell me what your proudest moment has been throughout your life. Well, I think I shared this with you when my daughter in a card wrote, and this is, but I've got another proudest moment. But the proudest moment really was as a mother when my daughter um wrote me a card saying that I was I was her role model. And uh, when you've had teenage daughters and you remember all the, mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think I was the best teenage mother. I mean, I wasn't a teen mother. I was, you know what I mean? <laughs> mother mother of teen. <laughs> That's it. Um, but I <laughs> Actually, if I had been, I would have been much younger now. Anyway, um, fixated on age. The Yes, so it was, to me, it was really just, it was a heartwarming moment because mm -hmm. not many people say that to you. Um, exactly. I've had students say to me, oh, look, you're such a role model and I'll take it as a beautiful compliment. But mm -hmm. when it comes from your daughter, because she said, look what you've done, look what you've achieved. And Aww. I'm so proud of you. So no, that was, that was a really um, beautiful. wonderful moment. But uh, I can't remember. I probably had a professional moment, but there's so many I'm proud of. <laughs> <laughs> so now you were talking about working with um a lot of the peace builders. Is mm. there anyone that stuck out in, in particular that you, or one group of, of peacemakers that you've worked with that you really felt that you had that impact that was a little bit more than what you expected or what they expected? Yes, definitely. And I was, this was one of, this is an organization I love and this foundation are based in Berlin and they contacted me thanks to a post on LinkedIn. Mm. Wow. Really? LinkedIn, no, but I have got most of my clients through LinkedIn, honestly, mm -hmm. and obviously referrals in Geneva, but it is such a powerful um, platform mm -hmm. when you're posting and writing things. And and anyway, so this lady who actually had met in Geneva vaguely, anyway, long story short, and so I went to train, she said, we have some former civil activists, I have to be very careful how I say this, it's a mm -hmm. euphemism would you train them because they're coming back into civil society now these peace mm. foundations what they do is they they're not the blue helmets that go in when there are wars but they go in post-conflict these mm. amazing foundations and they help local communities with infrastructures and um to to create the conditions for peace to fl to flourish mm. and anyway so would you come and train our peace i mean our um, former civil activists mm -hmm. I did and I was a little bit nervous but I thought well no it's essential 
communication tools. And it was really giving them, teaching them to engage. And I hadn't done this before, but I thought, I think this will work. To find this, their post-conflict story. So who do they want to become when they go back into civil society? Mm -hmm. you know, some of them were teachers. Some of them were very young at the time. And anyway, that was wonderful. And the feedback was extraordinary and more work followed. But I do remember, and I think m mentioning to you, I was so thrilled that I went straight on LinkedIn and I wrote this post saying, you know, named the foundation and named the cohort. And mm -hmm. what an amazing experience and how grateful I was to have made a contribution because I'm not a peacekeeper, mm -hmm. I'm just a wordsmith and a trainer. And within about three minutes, my client had phoned me she said take it down immediately please delete it and of course you know I'm going, oh my god and you know when you're in a stress and you think, yes. oh, I can't even find the delete button <laughs> um, because I had risked the the, the the security not only of the organization uh, but the former activists and she mm -hmm. said we never never do that so I learned and of course I groveled for about three weeks afterwards yes. because <laughs> working with them um but they, they were very sweet and they said no don't worry and it was only up for about mm -hmm. three minutes for me it felt like three years and uh, <laughs> I bet <laughs> so I did learn a lesson be very discreet don't mm -hmm. mention names and I mm -hmm. tend not to learn the mm -hmm. hard way <laughs> yeah well I think that's a, an important um initiative like at least the lady had the or the person that was working with you had the audacity to, to reach out and and educate you on that right because we can all get over zealous because we're excited about having made a difference well exactly and, and <laughs> she was uh, and she remains um, uh, you know, yes. an amazing right. but I'm so I'm well behaved now Sally <laughs> <laughs> now I can just imagine having worked with peacekeepers around the world and um, the different people that you've you've worked with so what would be the most moving professional moment that you've had I have to tell you that I work as a, I'm a, I do pro bono work with great pleasure. And I support an NGO in Geneva, which was founded by the most brilliant, inspiring woman who is Bosnian. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of grassroots, not, it's post, I mean, the, the war ended 25 years ago, but mm -hmm. there are always possibilities for things to flare up yes, in the Balkans. Absolutely. And so what she is doing, it, it's a lot of um, education, it's investing in social, in, you know, all mm -hmm. those amazing things which should keep society stable. But anyway, she came from a, a, a village called Trebenica, which in 1990, I shouldn't even be talking about it because it can be very political. But anyway, we went back to her village, which had been destroyed during the war and her family had been killed. And it was truly, I think, the most, as you say, it was the most moving moment in my life because we lead such sheltered lives, mm -hmm. don't we? Yes, we, we do. listen and read the news and um, we learn about conflict second, third hand, and we think, oh my gosh, this is terrible. But to go there with her to visit a place which no longer really existed, but she had to go back and see it. It was um, incredibly moving. And to listen to the stories of, um, you know, people who were, there were, there's a, a museum or it's a foundation dedicated to showing what had happened and why, but it's, it's staffed by both um, religious, mm, okay. people of all religious um, uh kind so it's not just mm. it's not just muslims it's christians and it's a very ecumenical if you like thing so that to me was sobering mm. it was very moving and um i think it did make me realize that we never know what the full stories are behind people because she my, my friend who i work for as a, an advisor she never spoke about it other than, it, you know, obviously she was a refugee and it was incredibly traumatizing. And then bit by bit, she never really went into specific detail, but the conversations we had on that day, I think we were just utterly, um, I think we were all in tears thinking for a country, for 
lost lives and, and opportunities so yeah absolutely it's very memorable but also very um the empathy and the understanding because as you say we we see things on tv we hear it on the news and we can we can almost shut it down right we don't have to feel that emotion going forward but when you're alive with somebody that's actually experiencing you know the the change in their whole lifestyle or, or their memories of absolutely childhood and it's completely been destroyed mm. the impact must have been just incredible and I think for me that was also a very important experience because you she is one of hundreds of thousands not just in that country but all over the world who, mm -hmm. who has experienced that and so um yeah and for me as a I mean I'm a, a side a very side act in this world mm -hmm. I go in and I deliver what I can and I come out but it was very um it made me feel that actually I I was in the right area because what mm -hmm. I do yes. words matter how we use them matter as we know <laughs> in current situations around mm -hmm. the world and if you can encourage people to think about the words they use mm -hmm. and how they're phrasing things and how they're presenting ideas mm -hmm. um, it can, I think it's an important skill and discipline. Yes. Mm. yes, you want to have the message land the way it's supposed to land. Exactly. Yeah. So now I understand that you're also working a lot with young leaders. So can you tell me a little bit about that? Yes, well, that um, really works. It, it, I was worked. I was involved in a project again in a certain country, and working with young leaders who were trying to find a new narrative for their country. And I and I was just there to facilitate the ideas because you know when you have a group mm. of 25, 30 year olds who are really dynamic and they they want mm. to rewrite the constitution here and now, and you need someone who's saying, well, look, what about this way? And is that really how you wanted to mm. frame it? And so I just thought that was something I loved doing. And it really made me realize that that's because I'm a, well, I'm a good teacher and I'm a good communication person. So when there are other opportunities, which there will be, I think, actually, I, I think I mentioned to you, it was this year, but next year, there are some um, big programs coming out where one of my clients in the international sector said, could you come and facilitate these two days? I just thought, I love that. Mm -hmm. I love that. Because, I mean, I teach at the universities on the executive development programs. You know, they are future leaders. Um, they're going to be diplomats. They're going to be heads of entre uh, ent enterprises and whatever international sectors. But it's that notion that if you can just give them some tools and mm -hmm. strategies to think more coherently about what is it you really are trying to say, Right. Because as you and I know, as I mean, you're a communication specialist. If you cannot articulate it yourself and understand it, then no one else is going to understand mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. and that's my starting ground. Well, and I've worked in lots of executive environments where a lot of people haven't had any training in that regard. Mm -hmm. And it's very obvious when they haven't versus when they have. Um, mm -hmm. And I remember some situations just in a corporate environment where we had the presidents and the vice presidents speaking. And this one woman was just so articulate, so polished, so incredible with her delivery. And then the other leaders were really not. And it became very evident on who had actually invested the time in their professional development and in how to be able to get their message across. Mm -hmm. um, and it was so evident in that particular instance that I saw that it was like wow why wouldn't you invest in that when you have such brilliance within you yeah that needs to be presented in a way that's going to be the most effective for people to receive and so I love that you're working with the young executives and the young leaders to be able to help them to develop that skill right away and that you're being the other thing that you've tapped into it's it's um and it's not just the young leaders it's existing leaders that we work with mm -hmm. um and it's something i care very passionately about it's the notion of executive presence and people say oh you either have it or you don't well i'm sorry you can if you don't have it you can acquire it yes. and 
as you would know, the, the, the two foundations of exec, well, there are three, but forget about the appearance, but the two foundations of executive presence, or presence, if you don't want to call it executive, it's gravitas. It's how we, how we present ourselves mm. and communication, how we say things. And that taps into the whole conversation about how do you read a room? How do you react to an audience? Mm. Can you change a speech quickly if you realize that the one, the person who's just come before you has said everything. So you're going to have to re, refigure mm-hmm. your opening. And how do you, how do you keep an audience's interest? And all those, that example you quoted of the brilliant lady who, or man, mm-hmm. who was a great communication person. I'm always astonished how badly people communicate. And yet mm-hmm. companies are, and organizations, that their greatest asset is their people. Yes. yes. And they don't invest in the yeah. way that they should. And especially at that, that higher level of leadership or the up and coming mm-hmm. to be able yeah. to help them to get there. Mm-hmm. So now I know there's been a couple of fun things that have happened along the way that might have been like, oh my gosh, why is this happening to me? Tell me a little bit about one of your funny stories that you might have had. Well, um, I suppose the, the at the time it was very vexing. <laughs> <laughs> But I have managed to laugh at it. I was giving a speech in Vienna mm-hmm. and I was so thrilled. I was invited to speak and being paid to speak, which is lovely. And I had this beautiful dress, very simple black dress mm-hmm. and some gorgeous high heels. Because I don't yes. know about you, but I'm, I'm, quite, I'm quite a pygmy. <laughs> so we need the stature. And I had my grandmother's pearls and I just knew it was simple but elegant just gorgeous and the morning that I was about to go to give this speech I was in this lovely hotel and I'm standing in front of the mirror fixing my hair makeup and thinking and then I don't know why I decided I was going to clean my teeth I mean who cleans their teeth if once they're dressed anyway (laughs) and I spilt this huge lump of toothpaste on the bottom oh no and I scrubbed it and I am actually known as the stain remover queen but of course I'm (laughs) frantically scrubbing it and I looked as though some seagull had landed on my <laughs> on my dress and I stood there absolutely traumatized because the only alternative was to wear a dress thank god I hadn't traveled in jeans um the, the, I'd worn this dress the day before I don't it's just an ordinary okay dress and I thought either I keep my jacket on but I knew that wasn't possible because I'm well you can see I'm fairly yes. <laughs> active and they, they, of course they'd see that the jacket would come and I know okay dress comes off so take the dress off and I had to wear the dress I wore the previous day and who likes wearing I mean I'm not I mean I'm a very clean person but no one mm. likes wearing the previous day's outfit exactly. and you know, so I, I wore it and it I just thought I'm not happy but of course you just have as they say the show goes on and I always tell my students and my clients and my diplomats you know it's not about you the moment you stand up on that Mm. at the or on the podium at the lectern I never use lecterns I hate them um it's about the audience so I just had to forget that I was wearing this fairly dorky dress (laughs) And hope I was making the right impact. But funnily enough, afterwards, one of the young um, young lawyers, she came up to me. She, oh, I love that. It was such a great presentation or speech. And she said, I do like your dress. It's really young. And I thought, oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so but the moral of the story is don't always pack two good dresses. Good dresses. <laughs> Yeah, I think I tend to overpack when I do that kind of thing. So, but then you get there and you're like, oh, I don't like how it looks today. So you have oh. to prepare for both. <laughs> so now I really enjoyed our conversation today, Susan. Thank you so much. Likewise. I really want to be able to help any of our viewers to be able to find a way to connect with you to find out more about what you do. So what have you got on the books? What's coming up for you? I have a number of workshops, and if anyone is interested, they are. I have speaking with Gravitas, 
which is a two-day workshop which really engages with that notion of building executive presence through communication. Mm -hmm. And it's my flagship workshop, which I have had over 600 people go through. So wow. that's one. But I also have um, something very special, which I, and I care very deeply about nervous speakers. Mm. And a lot of times people say, oh, well, nervous speakers, they'll never make it, or nervous speakers reluctant speakers say oh no I, I just don't want to get involved in that so I have um I have a mentoring program mm, for okay. I call it reluctant speakers and we're very excited about that because it 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 really will give what well, it does give people mm. tools and it's just been put together I mean it sounds as though I've just cobbled it together that's not the case but I was training some um, some speakers not so long ago, and one of them was very much, she said, I'm an introvert, I hate mm -hmm. doing this. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, this is something I can give. And I was able to, because it was a very small group, and I thought, actually, while there's a lot to be said for mixing groups, yes, but sometimes one-on-ones or groups with similar um apprehensions mm -hmm. and anxieties is a very powerful way to collectively bring people mm. up the curve. So that's that's, awesome. They're just two. <laughs> awesome. So we'll make sure that the links are there. And obviously you'll want to follow Susan, um, Dr. Susan Laverick on LinkedIn, because that's your main Absolutely. platform. And then Thank we'll make you. sure that we have up your website as well, so that Thank people you. can reach out to you. But it's been- And can I just thank you, because I really, um, I just love the the synergies between what we're doing. You know, you're inspiring women to achieve their passion and I'm encouraging people to find their passion. So yes. it's, it's been a lovely chat. Sorry for interrupting you then. Oh, no problem. Well, thank you so much. It's been wonderful to hear from you and to for our audience to be able to really embrace the value of having that confidence to be able to make some shifts in their life to be able to understand that those shifts lead us to something greater. They always do. Um, and some growth, but then also to be able to really understand and see in you the passion that you have for the work that you do. Um, you know, when you talk about a number of the different elements that we talked about today with working with the NGOs, helping the young leaders, the vibrancy within you, and I, you can feel the heart energy from you as far as this is your passion and this is where you you shine. And, and that's what we hope for every woman out there, every person out there to be able to have that ability to have stepped into their brilliance and to be able to serve people in such an impactful way. So it's been my honor to have you today as our guest, Susan, um, and I wish you all the best. So we will definitely put up this up uh, and make sure that you have all the contacts for Susan. So, but in the meantime, don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you, Sally. It's been an absolute joy. Really loved it. Thank you.